We're still on location in Washington, D.C. at the National Mall. And my, what a beautiful sight it is. We'll be meeting a young man making use of his physical challenges to inspire a unique group of young athletes. And author Mo Isom is stirring up religious order with her book, Sex, Jesus, and the Conversation the Church Forgot to Have. Well, we're going to have it right here on TPI. Stay with us. The show starts now. Hello, I'm your host, Muiwa. I'm so glad you've tuned in. You will not regret it. I'm in Washington, D.C. at the National Mall. This is a beautiful landscape with memorials and statues, which through its architecture tells the story of America. Now, speaking of storytelling, we have some amazing stories for you. First up, the man you're about to meet was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. But despite his physical challenges, he went on to become a gold medal runner and he's now helping others to overcome their physical challenges. My name is Fani, Van Amerwe. I was born in Virginia in the Free State. My mom was a, a teacher and my father was a minister. I was uh, born with, with CP, or cerebral palsy, the, the, the long word, but the short word is CP. Um, it's a disability um, that you get at birth and it affects your motor functioning of the muscles. From a young age, I loved sports in general, but running especially. I remember as a preschooler going um, to the big school to go run. I was the only guy getting onto my marks, going down on, on my marks and um, sprinting out. Um, I was in front, but before the finish line, I fell and everyone came running past me. And that kind of, yeah, was my introduction to running. But then my teacher told me, okay, Fani, um, maybe you must go, go try out for, for the disabled team. I remember she was also a bit scared to, to approach me like that because she didn't know how I would um, take it and how my parents would take it. But that was really hard for me to accept that, that I've got, got a disability, but it was a process where I had to make peace that, that, that I've got a disability. I remember um, when people asked me, so what is your dream? I would tell them um, my dream is to make the, the 2008 Paralympic Games, um, you know, and focusing for that for three or four years, um, actually making the team you know, was such a, a big celebration for me and you know, with my family and, and all of that. And, and I think also for me, the fact that I never thought I would, I would be an athlete and God giving me this gift um, made it just so much more special. That was really a, a gift for me, two gold medals at the Paralympic Games for me. Um, I, I just wanted to make a school team and God giving me two medals at the Paralympic Games. My turning point was uh, when I came to Stellenbosch. Uh, before that, I, I gave my life to the Lord a few times, but I was never discipled. And my, my Stellenbosch year was a turning point for me because that's where I, I made a decision to follow God. And also I was discipled um, and God gave me a space where um, I could grow in him, I could make mistakes and just learn what it is to follow him. We both had our turning points at the, at the same time. So that's where our like spiritual friendship really started um, growing so much. You know, that's the time where God started like touching our whole family, you know. It started kind of with, with me and him and then just overflowed to the rest of our family, you know. I believe uh, God gave both me and my brother, um, you know, something, a gift. And for my brother, it was um, extreme sports. For me, it was uh, athletics. And uh, we wanted to um, use that to glorify God and use that to in impact young younger people. It's called International Sports Leadership School. And the vision is to um, take the Great Commission of making disciples um, for Christ, but in the world of sports. It's not just about 
you know, coaching the physical side of a person, but also coaching people spiritually. And we can model something to them, not just on the track, but, but in life. He taught us if, you, if you're disabled, don't just give up. And you can still do sports and all this stuff. And um, he's, he's a great guy. And, um, we are proud of him and we, we love him. Fun is just being a, a guy that helps us and when we're down, he picks us up. Fanny was a great um, coach for me this past few years and uh, I learned a lot from him. He's, um, he's almost like a hero for me. He's like almost like my second dad. Fanny has shown me that I can do anything when I want to if I just believe in myself and, and, and believe in God. A lot of people have come closer to the Lord and accepted the Lord as their, their personal saviour. Also using what God has given them, uh, not for their, themselves, but uh, yeah, for, for, for His glory. Um, and, and I think also people taking responsibility for other people as well, discipling other people again as well. It's about personal relationship and discipleship. Disciples that's making disciples that's making disciples. There's a saying here in America that when life gives you lemons, make lemonade of it. Let me encourage you, whatever the difficulty you go through, don't allow it to turn you sour. Ask God to give you the strength and the grace to come through and make something sweet of the horrible situations we go through. Coming up, author Mo Isom sits down with Erica Linnea and has a frank conversation about sex and the things she wishes the church had talked about. Well, your book, Sex, Jesus, and the Conversations to Church for God, that is yes. a big title right there. <laughs> right? I feel like it needs no subtitle. It just says it all. <laughs> well, as I read the book, I, I realized you had all the makings of a good church girl. Your parents were together. Your parents, you said, were virgins when they got married. So you had a great example before you. But somehow you ended up in sexual promiscuity. What what happened? I, you know, vowed to be a virgin and and my sexual understanding looked like a to-do list. Do this, don't do that, this is right, this is wrong. And then when temptation entered, entered the equation and when lust entered the equation, it was hard. And my question often became, okay, how far is too far? What counts? What qualifies? What would still, you know, make me a virgin, but what can I get away with? And so it just started with rough foundations, with understanding the what to do and not to do, but never being talked to about why. At the young age of eight, you discovered like a pornographic card or something, and that led you down a journey yeah. for the next 10 years into pornography. Right. How did that affect your view on sex? I was exposed, yeah, at, at, at about age eight um, and was so confused and immediately felt shame. I didn't even understand the complexity of these things, but just seeing those images seared something in my heart. And you would think ideally then we would avoid that, but actually the enemy twists that and we become curious about it and we seek it out and we wonder about these feelings and the way they made us feel. And so I sought out more and more when no one was looking and um, really just fell into a stranglehold of enslavement. But I now feel a great urgency and responsibility to talk about these things because God desires freedom from these things, healing from these strongholds and um, yeah, restoration of, of what he always intended sex to be. And so hard stuff, but we got to talk about it. Your testimony is wonderful how you met the Lord, but when you met him, how did that change your view on sex? Did it affect your view on pornography? Yeah. Did it, how did it change you? My prayer became very early in coming to know Christ. Okay, God, I'm not good at controlling all of these things and even controlling myself. So God, break my heart for what breaks yours. I opened my computer screen uh, when I you know, was walking with Jesus, but was just overcome with urges. I opened my computer screen for the first time since coming to know Christ to watch porn. And the instant I saw something, I could have thrown up. It was nauseating, it was overwhelming. And I realized, 
oh, that prayer I've been praying carries power. Yeah. God's not thrown by the sin that we're wrestling in. He offers resuscitating grace and mercy. And um, it just transformed everything. And, and especially when it came to porn. One thing I let you talk about in the book is when you were with someone, you gave a piece of yourself away. How did God put you back together? Because you talk about a intimacy fast or fast from intimacy. Right. During that time, well, what is that? Yeah. <laughs> what is that process? And how did he put you back together during that time? It was so beautiful, hard at first, but amazing. What God did was he invited me into what I dubbed an intimacy fast. I called it kissless till next Christmas because it started <laughs> at the beginning of the year. And he said, just give me a year, a year of your whole heart. He said, give me all of yourself. And for me, that meant stepping away from dating, stepping away from flirting. Stepping, I operated as if I was in a monogamous relationship and treated anyone around me as if I was taken, you know, how we would function in marriage or in, in a committed relationship. And I simply put on the blinders and just set my eyes on Christ. God, do holy heart work in here, even if it's hard and even if it hurts. And he opened my eyes to my need to extend forgiveness, my need to seek forgiveness, to, to reclaim those pieces of my heart. I had to break those ties that they had with another. And the, what has the power to break those ties is the model of the cross. It is a forgiveness. Now, then you meet Jeremiah. Yes, yes. smoking hot husband. <laughs> <laughs> and the, I got to the point of the book because I'm reading, I'm like, oh yeah, this is great, she's free. And then I saw this sentence, here we go again. And I was like, yep. what? What happens with Jeremiah? The temptation is something we have to stay constantly and presently guarded and armored up against. Vigilant. <laughs> vigilant. And we just were not vigilant enough in having the right conversations and armoring ourselves up. And we began again to struggle with sexual sin. And we were navigating on this roller coaster of struggling and then knowing it and repenting together and then wrestling again and it just became exhausting. So we said, what, is, what does the word of God have to say about this? We, we can't keep navigating like this. And we looked at scripture and it gives us two options, two options in response to sexual sin, flee or marry. And so we married and it was the best decision I ever made. Now you and Jeremiah, you get married and I was shocked. I mean, it I was taken back when I read this part mm -hmm. um, where you said it wasn't it, you still felt guilty. Mm -hmm. What was, why did you feel guilty? What was there to feel guilty about at this point? There was stuff, there was mess in here that hadn't fully been worked out. And there wasn't a full understanding that Jesus is an essential part of the equation of a healthy sex life. And it was beautiful because on my honeymoon, um, after, you know, one night when I was, when I was upset, my husband just finally drew me in and just began to pray. And when my husband invited Jesus into that equation, that was when God really began to unpack the beauty and the fullness of what he always designed and the power of redemption, no matter what our past looks like. How can people get the proper view of sex? I think to come up in authenticity and vulnerability, to no longer allow sex to be taboo, to no longer allow it to be something we wrestle with in the darkness, but to allow light to shine into the darkness and in great humility, bring to God our struggles, but we can't stay silent any longer. And that's the conversation the church forgot to have. Yep. Thank yes. you. You're welcome. Thank you. What a wonderful interview. There are some conversations as parents, as church leaders, we absolutely have to have. Well, stay with us. You'll meet a man who survived a war, but almost lost everything. I hit it well. No one ever knew. And I think I was spiritually dead. And my soul was hungering for something. And the only thing that I could put into it was alcohol to cope. Your Turning Point experience doesn't have to end when the program is over. Follow us on your favorite social media.
Mike Gonzalez fought in the Iraq war. He was fortunate to come home alive. However, it was his unseen wounds that would almost destroy him and his family. Take a look. The phone rang at midnight. You're leaving. We would be the first army unit deployed into Afghanistan. We loaded into an aircraft, C-17, and landing into Kandahar, Afghanistan, late at night, freezing, being cold, not knowing what to expect. We were called upon to go into the battlefield and to do something great and to defend our country. Army Sergeant Mike Gonzalez proudly wore the uniform. Years of training had prepared him for action in the war on terror. Sacrifice came with service. I don't think that I ever felt good about being separated from my wife and kids. After six months in Afghanistan, Mike came home to Inez, his wife, and their children. It was the second marriage for both of them. Mike knew army life put a lot of stress on the best of relationships. So when he was home, he made it count. That was always exciting. That was like starting over again like getting to know each other all over again. And he was a great father. That's what I admired about him the most. Year-long back-to-back deployments to Iraq quickly followed. Being outside the wire at night, nothing can describe the horror or the expectation of being possibly killed. I worry immensely, not only for myself, but for my troops and for their families. I was always afraid to die. Death in your life begins to take over your life. For his service, Mike was decorated with 16 medals, including the Bronze Star for 100 successful missions outside the wire. But by his third deployment, Mike suffered from the initial symptoms of PTSD. Despite all the warnings from the Army, Mike used drugs and alcohol to numb his anxiety and depression. I hit it well. No one ever knew. And I think I was spiritually dead. And my soul was hungering for something and the only thing that I could put into it was alcohol to cope. Back home, asleep at night, Mike was still in Iraq. The nightmares were always of the enemy chasing me in different scenarios, in the sandbox, in cities, in mountains. Hundreds of them would chase me, and I would run as fast as I could. And in my dream, it was reality. I began to hear things. I began to see things. I began to look underneath every bed in my house. I became so paranoid that it began to eat me up alive. My wife would tell me, that is not my husband. I just thought that with time, perhaps things would get better. Mike's PTSD and addictions eventually led to frequent, abusive arguments with Inez. We argued about finances, we argued about drinking, we argued about our kids. Even after Mike was diagnosed and started treatment for PTSD, he spiraled downward. He started an affair with another woman, and then he left his wife and family. Sometimes he crashed with friends or slept in his truck or at a cheap hotel. I felt really hopeless. What kind of home am I gonna have with, with my children with no father? After three years of chaos, Inez sought a divorce. But also during that time, she started going to church. She cried out to God to rescue Mike and her family. And I remember saying, isn't that what you want? Isn't that why you created a man and a woman to, to have a family at, and for you to be in the middle? Two days later, Inez got an urgent text from Mike that he needed to talk. Mike shared with her about an encounter he had that wasn't a dream or a PTSD episode. Something was, was moving around and tickling my toes, being awakened three times. I quickly lifted the blanket I saw right in front front of me the most horrifying demonic entity and I jumped out of the bed with my heart pounding. I knew that it was a spiritual fight now, that with my post-traumatic stress disorder, that it was no longer just mental and physical, but that it was spiritual. Mike pleaded with Inez to come home. Inez says Mike came home a different man. He didn't drink, but instead he read the Bible. He asked to go to church with Inez too. One Sunday, Mike heard a sermon about the mercy and healing power of God. That's what I needed to know, was that there was a man out there by the name of Jesus Christ, that he was willing to give his life for mine. That that was his mission, to give me peace and joy. That's when I, 
uh, lifted my hands uh, in surrender, that I surrendered my life to Him, and that He was my Savior, my healer, that He would bring me back to life. Oh, a weight was lifted off my shoulder. Mike's genuine repentance and Inez's deep forgiveness restored their marriage. We're closer now and more in love now than, than we could have ever been. But she forgave me. She stuck with me. She's never stopped praying for me. That's real love. Healed too were Mike's intense feelings of isolation, depression, anxiety, and paranoia associated with PTSD. Now I know who I am. I am a child of Almighty God, that I can, will no longer fight these issues of PTSD on my own, that I had the Savior of the world with me. In 2014, Mike Gonzalez retired from the Army as a Chief Warrant Officer III. He went on to college and graduated in 2018. Today, he serves vets and active military as the Director of Outreach for Faith-Based PTSD Foundation at the San Antonio College Veterans Victory Center in Texas. Today, I walk around with a smile on my face with restored joy and happiness and peace. Jesus Christ changed my life. He can give us that unconditional love that can restore any marriage, any anxiety, any depression, any post-traumatic stress disorder, that God's love has power behind it. You know, I'm at the World War II Memorial in Washington, D.C., and all of us go through war. Sometimes we feel battered and bruised by it. We're left with scars, sometimes scars we can't deal with. I'm here to tell you that Jesus is able to help you, heal you, and give you a new start. All you have to do is invite him in today. And I want to pray for you as well. So let's pray together. Say these words with me. Lord Jesus, I confess that I have not been able to deal with the challenges that have come my way myself. I confess that I need help. I confess that you died for me on the cross. I confess that you give power to those who are weak. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. Make me new. And Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters who have prayed this prayer. I pray you grant them strength, strengthen their hearts, strengthen their minds, strengthen their bodies. I pray those who have been through situations that's broken their bodies, heal them now. Minds that have gone astray, heal them now. I pray for someone whose loved one has gone uh, wayward in their mind, that you would heal that mind and they would hear news of it today. We ask you in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. If you prayed with me, we'd love to hear from you. Contact us. During the break, you'll find out how you can reach us. Stay with us. There's more for you on TPI. Turning Point experience doesn't have to end when the program is over. Follow us on your favorite social media. Welcome back. We've reached the end of the show, but I have to say I've had such a blast here in Washington, D.C. If you're ever in the States, you must put this city in your travel plans. And remember, we're online 24-7. If you missed a story, an interview, please visit our YouTube page and subscribe. But also, 
We're always on Facebook and Instagram. Drop us a message there. We'd love to hear from you. We'll leave you with a song from the artist J.J. Hurston, the song called Miracle Worker. From all of us here at TPI, goodbye and God bless you. Somebody lift your worship all over this world. Thank you.